Hello. We are going to discuss the Herrera Murray book for ESL methods. We are going to specifically discuss chapters 3 through 5. Chapter 3 Linguistic Dimension of Methods for Culturally and Linguistically Diverse Students. First, Herrera and Murray discuss the dynamics of first language acquisition. So, there's different theories of how children learn language. The behaviorist theory is that children are born without language, but they learn language from their environment. And that when children use language effectively in an appropriate way, then their, that language that was used positively is reinforced by caregivers and adults. Also, probably by older siblings as well. For example, many times children begin by babbling, where they're trying out different phonemes or sounds. But when they start actually using real words, often the parents will get very excited and encourage those kinds of real words that make sense to um, people who are familiar with the English language. And so because those children are, are getting rewarded and getting praise for the positive ways they're using that language, they're going to be, they're going to conceptualize in their mind that those words are correct and some of the babbling noises they had made where the adults ignored them were not correct and not important. So basically children learn from from the adults and from older siblings what kind of language is valued and which is not. A second perspective is the innatist perspective. This is this theory says that learning a language is natural for humans and that humans have a tool called the language acquisition device, which is a part of their, like it's a process of the brain that facilitates language learning. And then an interactionist approach argues that language is learned primarily through communicating and interacting with others. And so children learn their language through interaction with their peers, with their family members, and with caregivers. So often the first language is initially learned in the home environment, and then the academic language is learned in the school setting, because many times the language that's spoken at home is informal language, especially if the family members have a moderate educational background, let's say they they have only had a K through 12 high school education, then the language they're speaking at home will mostly be informal language. The formal academic language that they'll see on academic tests and in textbooks and in more complex um, content specific texts will be learned at the school setting. So English language learners often do not have families that can support their English language development. So their families can help them support their language development in their native language or their first language, but many times the parents might not be fluent speakers in English. So for example, many of my students that I taught that were adults in my past career, I used to teach adult ESL at night. And so many of those students were actually learning English so they could help their, their children with their classwork and their homework. But unfortunately, many of them were not fluent English speakers, so a lot of the language that the children were learning at their homes was primarily in their native language. So my, my, the parents that were taking my class were primarily Spanish speaking, Vietnamese speaking, and Arabic speaking. And so their children were learning those languages at home, which is great. It's important to learn and have a strong proficiency in their first language. But my main point in explaining this is that the children did not have the academic language in English that they would 
have received if maybe their parents were highly educated English speakers. And so the children really depended on the academic language and learning that academic language in, in a school setting. Nevertheless, it was very important that those children develop their first language because they've done studies that students with a highly developed first language can easily transfer skills from their first language, such as um, cognates, phonetic awareness, um, text awareness, print awareness, um, some, voc some vocabulary terms that are similar across languages, also the concepts of a story or the concepts of, of text, how it's organized. So a lot of these things can be transferred from the first language to the second language. And so they've done studies and students learn English at a much faster rate if they have developed their first language at a proficient pace. So if they become fully fluent in their first language, they learn their second language, English, at a much faster rate. So they've actually done studies where students who were in bilingual classrooms who learned lingua, let's say they learned English at maybe 50% of the time and the other 50% of the time they learned Spanish, those students, because they developed their native language Spanish and became fully proficient and developed the content knowledge in, in Spanish, they were able to transfer their skills so that they learned actually more English than someone who was in an all ESL class that, only, that had 100% English instruction. Moreover, ELL students rely on peers and teachers to help develop their academic language and their target language. So it's very important that you have mixed grouping where you have um, students with a higher academic language paired with students with lower academic language because the students can learn from each other. The, the students with a higher academic language benefit from practicing and reteaching the material to the students with the lower academic vocabulary and the lower academic vocabulary benefit because t students often pay more attention to their peers, especially at particular ages in the educational process than even they pay attention to their teachers. And so they benefit from that interaction with their peers. Also, of course, the teacher should obviously make a concerted effort to build that academic language and academic vocabulary in her students as well. Fillmore argues that in order for students to learn a second language, the following must exist. Students must be motivated to learn the language and perceive that the language is meaningful. So they have to perceive a purpose of it. They also have to have speakers in the classroom who are fluent enough in the target language so that they can be models for those students. And so ideally, in this case, it would be the teacher and maybe other peers who have a higher level of academic vocabulary, a higher level of um, language proficiency in the target language. Also, the classroom setting must encourage the language learners to be fluent speakers, and they should have um, regular communication and regular um, contact with native speakers or speakers who have a higher proficiency than the students who are developing their language so that this can help facilitate language learning. So in many ways, the best programs for bilingual programs are the 50-50 dual language model where half the class are native speakers of the majority language, English, and then the other half are native speakers of a minority language such as Spanish. And then both students benefit from having role models who are more fluent speakers in each language. And so what happens is the native English speakers learn Spanish as their second language, and the native Spanish speakers learn English as their second language. And so both students end up becoming bilingual. And the English language learners, the Spanish, the native Spanish speakers, actually develop English at a faster pace than what they would have developed if they were in all English, monolingual, 100% English instruction classes.
other conditions are also needed for second language acquisition. So for second language acquisition, students also must be encouraged to make connections between their prior knowledge and their con and content knowledge that they've already learned. It's meaning they must also have meaningful practice with new vocabulary, and they also should use those vocabulary words in a variety of contexts. So they should not just use it by reading those vocabulary words or writing down those vocabulary words, but they also need to use it in other domains of language, such as listening, speaking, and they should practice with the target vocabulary in several different ways. So maybe they might hear the, the vocabulary word, they might say it out loud, they might say the definition, they might act it out, so that'd be kind of a kinesthetic application. They could act out the vocabulary word, then they could write, make their own sentence orally and then write down their sentence and then trade sentences with their partners so they would read each other's sentences. That way students have a multimodal, multidimensional representation of the word in all four domains of language. Furthermore, the environment must be conducive to learning. So it must have a low level of anxiety for English language learners. And the English language learners must feel comfortable and accepted in that learning environment. Also, it's important to note that the concept of communicative competence. So communicative competence is the ability of a person to understand language and to reproduce that language in particular contexts. And so this basically, you know, you see the word communicate, communicate in the word communicative. And so communicate, obviously, people are able to use language to effectively communicate and interchange messages and receive messages between two people. And so communicative competence basically just means, in, in layman's terms, the ability for a person to communicate with other people effectively. And so there is the ability for them to listen and understand what is being said and also make comprehensible speech that relays that person's message that they are intending to send to the other person. And so some context examples would be locations where you would use language. So in many cases, people have communicative competence that is higher in certain types of um, settings or contexts than in others. So, for example, many times people with very uh, developed informal language might be really effective at using language in everyday situations like shopping or maybe at work, doing a job that they've, they've seen and they've been experiencing for many years. Also, maybe uh, in social situations, but then those same people who have mostly an informal language might have trouble in other more context reduced situations like uh, academic situations where they have less support, where they can't really see the speaker, they have to read the text, and the language is more complicated. So, context can be all kinds of things. Once again, it can be shopping a debate, it can be a science experiment, working on the job site, a social event, um, reading a passage. And so many people have, once again, varied language abilities based on their, on the context in which they're using language. So a lot of my students had a lot of informal language, so they had really good ability to communicate in the context of socially, like outside in the playground, or um, maybe in, um, you know, extracurricular activities, and they are able to navigate um, the school and navigate uh, in the cafeteria, for example, in the library. But then often I had to work in helping to develop their academic language because in some of the other contexts, like reading a passage or reading a word problem and, sol and finding out how to solve it or um, learning a new concept with new vocabulary, a lot of times I had to help provide scaffolds so to help support them in learning 
and communicating in that context. So I would give them like sentence stems to help them uh, write out a word or write out a complete sentence, excuse me, or I would give pre-teach the vocabulary so they would be familiar with the new words that we were learning in the lesson. Or I would teach them strategies of how to understand the, how the text was organized in, in a passage so they could better understand that passage. So like, for example, in nonfiction, the main idea is often at the topic sentence. And then the next sentences are more of giving specific details that support the main idea. Or I would teach them the the setup or the how the plot is organized in a fiction story. So you have a setting, you have the characters, you have a problem, the characters working on the problem, and then the solution. So that helps students organize the information and understand the text and break down the text, which made it more easier for them to understand in that in those more academic contexts. So there's four elements of communicative competence. There's grammar competence, so this could be pronunciation, vocabulary, word formation, and making sentences, also spelling. Then you have sociolinguistic competence, and this would be the kind of interaction or using communication for particular purposes. Also, it would be understanding formal versus informal language, so being able to tell the difference between what language you should use in an informal setting, like a party or a social event, versus what kind of language you would use in the classroom or when you're writing an academic paper. And also those people could find the difference between language registers. So they could understand the difference between someone, they would still be able to understand people, but they could tell that maybe someone has an accent from New York versus an accent from the Panhandle or for an accent from California, for example. And so they could tell that people have different accents, but they would also understand what those people are meaning and what they're saying in their communication. Furthermore, you need to also have discourse competence. So discourse competence means you can make meaningful communication. So you have, you understand the syntax, the meaning of a sentence, what it, how it's, um, not only what each individual word means, but how the words mean together as a complete sentence. Then you must also have strategic competence. So strategic competence is when you can overcome challenges or difficulties in communication. So if you're unsure what a word means or what that person is saying, you can find a synonym, you could use a gesture, you could change your tone of voice or add emphasis on what you're trying to say. That way you could help relay your point to someone. So basically it's a way to troubleshoot if someone is not understanding what you're saying, it's finding ways to communicate in different words and in different ways, often nonverbal ways, to get your point across to someone who might not understand the language you're using, the exact language. So there are many ways to support accelerated second language acquisition. So by this, um, Herrera and Murray are explaining, this is how you can help quickly develop your student's second language. And so the first way is to provide authentic literacy instruction. So try not to focus on like very basic things such as like the sounds of the letters or, um, what does print stand for, like print has a meaning, often students will have that from their native language. Now, if they are native um, speakers of Arabic or Hebrew or uh, Mandarin Chinese where they were using symbols versus letters, then you might have to teach the letters and the sounds, um, but you probably do not have to teach them that when people write, they're trying to convey a meaning, or when people when a book has print and the purpose of that print is to tell a message to the reader. They probably already know that. They might also already know the text structure, the elements of a sentence. So you, you want to assess their student's prior knowledge, but you, and once you assess their prior knowledge and you see that they have some of a, a strong background in their native language, then you can transfer those skills to English. Also, 
focus on the most critical concepts first. So by that, you want to make sure you teach students um, language through the content area. So you want to make sure that they're staying at the same level in terms of in math, science, social studies, reading as their age level peers. So you still want to teach them the content, but you want to support their understanding of the content as much as possible. Another way is you could you could teach context clues for for students to understand and under and be able to identify somewhat confusing words. So there, there's several strategies. For example, many times in the text, a word will will be defined or it will be restated with a synonym or it will give an antonym. And so many there are many clues that you can use to help teachers excuse me to help students break down unknown words and help them find clues in the sentence to understand the meaning of that unknown word. So even though they haven't necessarily heard that word before or they haven't seen it in this context, they can use clues and words from the sentence that they do understand to help build an understanding of that new word. Another way to provide authentic literary instruction is to provide scaffolds by gradually increasing the vocabulary and the the difficulty of the vocabulary, the complexity of the vocabulary. Also, it's very important to connect to students' prior knowledge and connect that prior knowledge to new knowledge. Furthermore, you want to review the most important concept information to help deepen understanding. And we've seen a, a lot of this in the PSYOP book as well. So in the PSYOP book, they explain that you can put the review at the very end of the lesson. So you you pre-teach the vocabulary, you pre-teach the most important concepts in your explicit instruction, and then at the end of the lesson, after you've done guided practice and independent practice, and students are about to maybe either practice some more or do an assessment, before you do that um, assessment, you make sure to review the key, the key vocabulary terms and the key concepts of the lesson, and that helps the deepen understanding. So now let's talk a little bit about the process of linguistic dimension. So in Krashen's natural order hypothesis, people first develop language through listening, then speaking, then reading and writing. Kind of like how a baby learns language. So a baby will first learn through listening to other people speak. Then they'll start practicing speaking and maybe starting to make comprehensible words, their first words. Then later, often in the school setting, they'll learn how to read. And then from their their knowledge of reading print, they'll start to also be able to write print. So Krashen also explains the specific stages of second language acquisition. So normally the first stage is called the pre-productive stage. So this is when someone is learning their second language and they're being put into an environment that's primarily speaking that second language. So this would be an example this would be a, how many English language learners learn their second language English. They learn their native language in their home country or at home and then when they get into the school setting they are many of them are put in primarily English classrooms, especially if they do not have bilingual classes for that language. And as we've talked about, if they do have bilingual classes in the student's native language, those are the ideal places for students to study. But if, they, let's say, you have a native Arabic speaker in Canyon ISD, they might not have enough native Arab speakers and a native Arab speaking teacher to provide a bilingual classroom for that student. So that student will be placed in an ESL or even a mainstream all English monolingual classroom. So during the pre-production stage, that student would ha have somewhat of a silent period. They would mostly be listening to the target language, 
they would communicate through nonverbal measures. They, would, they might communicate with gestures. And that silent stage or that gesture period, the pre-production stage, can last several months. In the early production stage, the ELL can start to read phonetically, especially if they've had some understanding of language in their first language. And they start reading phonetically, but they do it based on their native language pronunciation patterns. So they will be able to start reading the words, decoding the words, and understanding simpler text, but they might not be pronouncing the word out loud perfectly. Also, they'll start to listen with increased understanding. So they'll be able to understand more of what the teacher is saying and what their peers are saying. They'll repeat very memorable words that they find most important. So this could be like lunch or recess or grades or homework, things like that. They'll see connections between their native language and their target language. So they'll start to recognize cog cognates or words that sound the same, look the same, and mean the same in bo across both languages. So like in Spanish, ciencia is like science in English or Mathematicas is like math in English. So there's many cognates across languages. And so students will start to recognize those. They'll also start being able to use visual and contextual supports to help aid in their comprehension. So they might be able to associate a picture in the textbook or a photo in the textbook with the particular word they're practicing or the particular concept. And that will help them build understanding of that concept. Or maybe they can also start to pay more attention to when their teacher emphasizes a particular concept or when they're using gestures to demonstrate a concept. The student will feel will be more acclimated and more um, aware of those contextual supports. Furthermore, the ELL student will also start to take more risks. They'll start to speak in short sentences but sometimes those sentences might have some syntax errors. Like, for example, the sentence, me lunch now. What they're trying to say is, I'm hungry, when is lunch? So they might not have all of those vocabulary words, but they're starting to practice speaking, especially with those um, simpler sentences. Even though they might have some errors, it's important to recognize that they're attempting to communicate and to extend to accept that communication and respond to it, to value that communication. So answer that question. You can also try to politely correct how they say it, but first you want to answer that question, then you want to also go over and maybe help them correct the actual um, simple sentence in a nice positive way, emphasizing the significant effort they gave and risk they took into communicating in their second language. The next step is speech emergence. So this is when the English language learner has more word attack and comprehension skills. So they start understanding things like how to use context clues in a sentence or in a text, or they'll know strategies of how to look up words. And they'll also understand more how to understand the organization of text. And so they'll have specific skills that will aid them in breaking down unknown words and also understanding more difficult texts. They'll have increased accuracy in their speech and in their writing. They'll also um, be interested often to help peers and the teacher So they'll, in translating, so they'll start to be uh, a translator for the teacher or be interested in facilitating the teacher's communication with other English language learners who have a lower level of language. They'll speak in fuller sentences using a richer vocabulary and they'll also have increased reading comprehension. So they'll need less um, contextual clues. So they'll need fewer pictures, so they won't need to have as much simpler vocabulary. They, they'll be able to read sentences and texts that are close to grade level. 
they won't necessarily need simplified sentences anymore. Once again, they'll be able to read at the same grade level at, for the most part as their peers. Finally, the, stage, the next stage is advanced fluency. And so this is when the student can think abstractly in their target language. And so they can think of complex sentences and they, um, it's not just a simplistic um, visual image, but they can think of kind of an abstract concepts such as like justice or um, morality or, or things that, that require critical thinking and much more in-depth um, abstract concepts. They'll be they'll start to develop individualized reading interest, and they'll also increase their variety in the types of books they'll like to read. They'll become very accurate in their language and grammatical structures, and they'll become almost nearly as equal to native English speakers and their ability to communicate with uh, grammatical accuracy. They'll use the native language as an asset to help them in their future learning. So if they do get into complex um, concepts with unknown vocabulary, they might still try to use their native language to help support them, like with cognates or, or help remember things they've learned in their past in their native language or maybe read the text first in their native language and then transfer it to um, reading it again in English. And so they'll use those skills from their native language to help support their future learning. They'll also know multiple strategies for how to read with comprehension. So understanding textual organization, text structure, um, finding context clues, um, rereading, metacognitive awareness of, you know, am I understanding what I'm reading? Do I need to go back and reread it? Um, focusing on the um, being able to identify the main ideas versus um, less important details. So there's also a linguistic process of understanding concepts about print. So when English language learners understand print and the concepts of print, the ELL students must understand the following things. First, that print carries a message. That, and it could be in various forms, the message. It could be in a storybook, a novel, a letter, an email. All of those are forms of print, forms of writing, but they all carry a specific message. Furthermore, an ELL student should understand that print corresponds to speech. And so what is spoken orally like phonemes, syllables, words, sentences, all of those things come from or have a corresponding print. And so the way we form language is first we start with the phonemes, the sounds, like the a, ah, e, eh, those kinds of sounds. Then you, you put them together to make syllables like at, and then you put those syllables uh, together to say, to make a word like atmosphere. And then you put those words together to make a sentence. The atmosphere is made out of gas. So one way to, to help support um, the concept that print corresponds to speech is to emphasize cognate. And we've talked about those a little bit. Also, an ELL student must understand directionality. So in the United States, we read text from the left to the right, or in English, we read text from the left to the right, and we read from the top of a page to the bottom of the page. And this might be a little different than some of the students' native languages, like in Hebrew or Arabic or Mandarin or, or Hmong, the students read from right to left, and they might not always read from top to bottom. So it's important that... These, that you gauge your students to see if they already know these concepts when they enter your classroom. So you might do a quick pre-diagnostic or observe them as they read, maybe even as they read in their native language. But then if they do not have these concepts already built in from their native language, then you, you must explicitly teach all of those concepts.
because these are very fundamental, inherently important concepts for understanding print. A fourth concept that also is very important is to show teach students parts of text. So you know how a book has a front cover, a back cover, a title page, table of contents that explains where each of the topics are, chapter or section headings, and captions as well to explain pictures. You also need to teach the organization of text. And we've talked a little bit about that already, but you know, main idea starts with the topic sentence and then the supporting details to, ex to justify the topic sentence. And then fiction, of course, we, we just talked about that as well, but fiction has its own um, textual organization as well. And so we, you can't always assume that those students have that pre-existing knowledge. They might have that knowledge from their native language, or it might be slightly different in their native language, how um, texts are organized. So it's very important that you assess if students know this already when they enter your classroom, and then explicitly teach those skills if they do not. So some specific tools for teachers to understand their students' language level could be a language biography card. So this is where the students, you would work, you would write your own based on your observations with your students to see, and which, but through talking with their parents, you could write this biography card. And so in the biography card, you identify your, the student's skills in each language, their prior academic experiment, experience, their preferred grouping, so who they like to work with or what kind of situation, small group versus whole group or individual, and then how the student processes, processes in what language, and then also what kind of assessment considerations you should have or assessment accommodations the student might need. And so that's important. So if you write those down for each of your English language learners, then you can quickly have that as a reference. So when you're trying to provide the most effective instruction as possible, Understanding what kind of language background and academic background the students have, either through talking to the parents or looking at their student portfolio or their cumulative folder from past schools, those can help support you in making these biography cards, which you can quickly reference to improve your instruction. Also, another tool is thematic units. So if you have a unit that's based on, let's say, um, the ocean, where you talk about um, not only the science of the ocean, but maybe the geography of where the ocean is located and what kind of people depend on the ocean, so it's social studies, and maybe writing stories about the ocean or reading books about the ocean, and so that would incorporate reading. So if you have those um, cross-curricular units, those thematic units, those often will build up context for the students. And the student can still understand those thematic units based on their background knowledge and the context they've built up from earlier lessons in that unit. And they'll have more access to more cognitively demanding concepts. Third, you can also, like we talked about earlier, provide heterogeneous grouping. So group the students with higher language abilities with the lower language abilities and also group across content knowledge or academic ability as well. So group students who are advanced learners or learn quickly um, versus students who are might take need additional practice and are slightly slower in learning new concepts. And so you group those students with mixed levels. So once again, the advanced or high students learn through teaching, so they learn more in depth the concepts and they practice their communication skills through reteaching it to their peers. And the students who were, uh, who are, were less advanced and lesser developed learn from the example of a peer. So there's many, oh, so now let's talk about chapter four, accommodation readiness. So there's many predictors of success for English language learners. So the first predictor of success for English language learners is that they're receiving cognitively complex instruction in their first language for as long as possible. So this could be like having a portion of the day 
in their first language and then another portion of the day in their second language. Or it could be where they're developing strong abilities and strong content knowledge through their first language, like in a bilingual classroom, and then through some other then for some other subjects or in other parts of the day they're learning in their target language. Second, it's important to teach the academic curriculum in both the first language, the native language, and the second language. Also, it's very important that you have an active lesson that involves discovery and cognitively complex learning, so higher order thinking skills. And the reason why you want to teach them the academic curriculum in their native language is because you don't want them to fall behind their age level peers. And they'll, they'll understand the content knowledge much more effectively in their native language. Now, if you do not know the nat native language of your student, let's say you might not have knowledge of that student's native language, you can still help support their understanding of content by providing books or texts in their native language or audio recordings in their native language or videos in their native language or providing them with um, a dictionary for reference or visuals. And so you can still accommodate and help support their native language development as much as possible. And then those students will be able to transfer those skills from their native language to their second language. Also, it's very important that you, going back to um, number two, is that students also must have cognitively complex learning. And so you need to have, you still need to challenge your students of higher order thinking skills and making them to think critically and have the skills that they'll need in the real world to be successful because those are the kinds of skills that will not only be tested on standardized tests, but it also will be, once again, essential for their success as an adult. And so you still want to teach them those higher order thinking skills and challenge them and have a rigorous activity where they really have to um, you know, think beyond just the simple remember this fact or describe this explanation, but where they can actually think for themselves and incorporate the content into new situations or in new uh, contexts. Third, it's very important that ELL students are integrated with non-ELL students, so native English speakers, in a manner that affirms the ELL students' first language and their culture. So you want to make sure that you incorporate that student's culture in your lessons. You want to um, try to find out more about that culture and ask that student to provide um, background information. Uh, maybe you'll celebrate some of the cultural events of that culture. Also um, have visual representations of that culture through pictures or maps or photos. And also have a visual representation of that, of that student's language. So have books in that native language or have uh, posters in that native language. And so remember, you want to make sure that you teach language in an additive context. So students are learning a second language, English, but they're also maintaining their first language and their first culture. And so, um, th so in this concept of the additive concept top text, bilingual education is a form of gifted and talented education in the sense that students are being challenged and being... Um, and are developing practical, really important, and highly demanding, um, cognitively demanding skills in learning a second language while maintaining their first language. Also, of course, in general, you have to keep a positive, safe school environment for English language learners so they feel supported in the classroom and, and enjoy the educational experience. They've done some research findings in that that there's a cognitive advantage for being bilingual than over being just monolingual. And so bilingual students have um, 
divergent thinking skills. They can think of more than one answer. They can see multiple answers to an open-ended problem. They're often more creative. They have metalinguistic awareness, so they understand the nature and the form of language and how language is structured. Also, they have communicative sensitivity. So they understand in what context or what situations should they use one language versus the other. And they also understand the social nature and communicative functions of language. And so they can interpret social situations better to determine what uh, not only what language they should use to communicate with other people, but how they should use that language and what tone or in what uh, what kind of contextual supports like gestures or uh, emphasis on certain words should they use to help um, explain their meaning more effectively. Furthermore, in other areas of thinking, there is no disadvantage for being bilingual. So bilingual students have equal skills as monolinguals in the other thinking abilities. And there's plenty of room in the brain to learn several languages. So one language does not replace the other. So you can maintain your native language and learn a second language and none of that will take away from your doesn't have to none of that has to take away from your native language. Or the existence of a native language does not limit your acquisition of a second language. In fact, it helps you acquire a second language. So let's talk quickly about the iceberg analogy. So the iceberg analogy is to explain the common underlying proficiency model. And in this model, it explains that um, if you look at it, there's a, the first iceberg is the first language. And then the second iceberg is a second language. So even though on the surface they look like they're two separate um, concepts, they might be two separate parts of the brain, actually in reality they're not. They're from the same processing system of the brain. So your brain uses the same um, parts of, of the brain, the same functions of the brain to speak in various languages. And so actually there's not going to be some confusion by learning a second language. Rather, um, the brain has already developed those skills from the first language and can quickly apply those skills from the first language to the second language. So it won't cause like cognitive dissonance where the brain is confused. Instead, the brain already knows how to naturally adapt and naturally um, differentiate between when to use one language versus another. To discuss common underlying proficiency in greater detail, the same central engine of the brain produces the thinking for any type of language, for and also for any type of language domain. So when you're listening in English or in Spanish, you're using the same type of the brain. When you're speaking in either language or any language, you use the same type of brain regardless of what language you're speaking. Same thing for reading and writing. So the main takeaway is that the brain has plenty of capacity to store two or more languages. And the brain will not get confused if you learn a second language. In fact, the brain can use some of the same skills it uses for the first language to help acquire and practice with the second language. Another thing that's important to know is that you can learn content equally well in one language or if you learned content across two languages let's say you might learn English you, excuse me you might learn math in English but you might learn language arts in another language like Spanish you could still learn content equally well as if you had learned both subjects only in English or only in Spanish so that just means that as a teacher, do not be afraid that your students access the content in their native language because that contextual skills will help, help them as they also see the content in English. It's important though that whatever language that you're giving the lesson or the content material to the student, 
that language must be significantly developed so that the student can understand and can process the content. Also, you want to make sure that their abilities are very well developed because especially if you have higher order thinking skills in your lessons, you want your student to be able to process and demonstrate their knowledge with those skills with their language, but their language has to be pretty well developed. And so if students' language is not developed, you have to take that in mind and help provide contextual supports like we've talked about in earlier chapters. If students are forced to understand content when it has not sufficiently been developed, like their language hasn't sufficiently been developed, then students could be missing some of that content. So if you teach your content lesson to an English language learner at the same pace and at the same, um, using the same types of vocabulary and the same um, format as you would teach to your native English speakers, you, that an English language learner might be missing out on some of that content if their language has not been fully developed yet. And then once again, if one or both of the languages of a student are not functioning sufficiently, then that could lead to decreased academic function. So it's very important that students have a strong ability in their native language and that they also are explicitly taught important skills in their second language, English, so that they have a strong ability in both languages. That way you can ensure that their academic functioning, their content knowledge is, is being processed effectively regardless of what language the content is taught in. Let's describe the different types of bilingual programs. We've mentioned them briefly already in this class, but just in case. So an additive program is where students maintain and continue to practice their first language, and then they add a second language to their knowledge, and they maintain both languages. So they maintain their native language that they learned at home or in their home country, and they learn their second language. So in the United States, that would be English for an English language learner. Subtractive bilingual programs, unfortunately, emphasize the second language so much and lack practice in the native language so that students end up having the target language English replace their native language. And so the native language ability in, let's say, in Spanish or Vietnamese or Arabic or Mandarin deteriorates so much that it could even be lost. And so then you have um, many children in um, that grow up are teenagers and they've when they um, they have very little abilities in the language that their parents speak at home their native language but they're mostly fluent in the language of the classroom which is English let's describe a little bit about additive bilingual programs in more detail so there's different types, but some of the types we've talked about are the developmental bilingual programs, and this would be an, when an English language learner develops proficiency in their first language, and then they remain in bilingual classes and they still receive instruction in their native language, but at the same time, they're learning English for part of the day as well. And these developmental bilingual programs would be in which a student practices with their native language up until at least the sixth grade. Then we also have two-way dual language programs, or another way to call them is two-way immersion programs. And this is when you have a mixture of English language learners and native English speakers. I kind of mentioned it earlier. And you have 50% of the instruction is in, this, in one native language, let's say English, and then the other 50% of, of the instructions in the in the native language of the English language learners, let's say Spanish, for example. And in this model, it promotes cross-cultural respect between both groups of students, and then also it allows students to support each other and supports mutual thinking. And so at the end, like we've stated before in this lecture, the native English speakers who join those two-way dual-lingual programs learns the minority language like Spanish, or Mandarin 
and then the English language learners keep their native language that they've learned at home and they develop their second language, English. Now let's talk about subtractive programs. So subtractive programs would be ESL programs, so like ESL immersion, and this would be when you have a mixture of ELL students and non-ELL students. Or you could also have sheltered English, where you have ELL students placed in one group all together. Or you could have pullout, where the ELL students go with a certified ESL teacher for small group instruction for part of the day. And so unfortunately, during those ESL programs, they're technically subtracted because the first language is not being practiced. Now you could rem remedy this as an ESL teacher by providing your students with access to text in the first language, um, instructional, um, instructional um, tools or instructional um, content in the first language. And you could also provide them access to um, native language supports and to practice native language. And so you can remedy this, but if you do not, if ESL teachers do not take that into consideration, then theoretically that, that would be a subtractive program because students could lose their native language. Another type of subtractive program are transitional bilingual programs where students learn their first language in the initial years, but then they quickly um, start to focus on the second language, the majority language, which would be English. Sometimes these transitional bilingual programs also separate based on content subjects. So maybe in the first couple years, like pre-K, kinder, and first grade, um, language arts might be taught in students' native language, let's say like Spanish, but then science and, so science and math are taught in English. And then eventually all subjects are taught in English and only um, if necessary the teacher provides Spanish support for those students who are struggling to acquire English. And so the goal of those transitional programs are as soon as possible to have students fluent in their second language, English. It's not incredibly important whether or not they, they are fluent in their first language for these programs because the goal is to transfer those students outside of the bilingual program into all English classes. And so the main goal is for students to quickly be able to function in an English classroom and if they retain their native language that's a plus but it's not guaranteed and so for that in that case since often students actually lose their native language through these programs they call these transitional bilingual programs as subtractive because students native language is being replaced by English because there's so much emphasis on English especially in the later grades. So by like second grade or third grade, most students are encouraged to exit the bilingual program and to stop using their native language in the school setting. So they stop learning their academic language um, in their native language. So they stop learning academic vocabulary and they stop reading texts that are grade level appropriate in the native language. And then they start shifting toward the dominant or the majority language, which would be English. So you might have students who leave that program with um, at most a first or second grade reading level in their native language. But maybe, hopefully, at least in English, their language and reading level has is age level appropriate, but still those students lose their first language. So that's why it's called subtractive. Let's now talk about chapter five. So a framework of accommodation readiness. So teachers have to have different levels of readiness for how um, they're ready to provide the necessary accommodations for their English language learners. So the first level is called readiness for critical reflection of practice. And so this is where a teacher checks their assumptions and they search, basically they're searching for what they have, assumpt what assumptions they have for English language learners and then they try to uncover what they are in terms of they start to reflect whether or not their assumptions, what they think is true about English language learners are valid. And then they start having critical reflection. So they think critically on their prior experiences and their prior assumptions. 
and you evaluate if they were correct. Also, it's they use this time for an, personal growth. So they think about how they could possibly change their thinking and change their expectations based on research and facts. Moreover, they also start to look for professional development opportunities so they can change their practice and improve their educational outcomes and um, efficacy that they provide to their students. So the, the efficiency of their instruction. Level two of accommodation readiness is when the teacher is ready to interact with English language learner students and families. So culturally and linguistically diverse CLD students and families. And so during this stage, the teacher finds ways to identify students' prior language experiences, the language used at home, their prior academic language experience, and their academic interest and their goals. And so the teacher will use semi-structured conversations like open-ended questions um, between the students and the teacher and also the, te the teacher and the parents to better understand the student. And so through this, the teacher understands how they can make the content most relevant to students and how they can access prior knowledge and build background from what students already know. Level three is environmental readiness. And so this is when the teacher starts to think what kind of external environments affect the student. So what issues are going on in the region, the state, the country, et cetera? Or for example, how will that student be assessed? Or what expectations do, does the state have for the student's academic progress? Moreover, the teacher starts to provide the instruction that is best for their students. Regardless of, let's say, the end of the year test, the teacher makes sure that the students are learning all of the content objectives, objectives and learning critical thinking skills that will help them later in life. And so for practices that are policies that do not benefit students, the teacher works on behalf of the students to speak out on the student's behalf and to make sure that they're defending their students' learning progression and their students' uh, right to have an effective education. And so the teacher spends a lot of time focusing on the internal environment as well. They make sure that their school and their classroom are very positive learning experiences in which students can still um, respect and practice their culture and language while also developing a knowledge of the English language and the English culture. And so teachers can make sure that their classroom environment is positive, supportive, welcoming, and it promotes multiculturalism and tolerance of different beliefs. And how all students respect each other regardless of um, whether they actually hold those same cultural beliefs or not. And so the teacher also thinks how they can best support collaboration among students or in cooperation, and also how they can help develop students' higher order thinking skills or critical thinking skills in their lessons. So they're thinking about the best types of engagement strategies and instructional practices for their English language learner students. Level four is curricular readiness. And this is where the teacher understands the objectives that they must teach to English language learners and the scope and sequence of the district. So what the district expects students to learn at what time and when what assessments the district will give students to assess how they've been progressing and learning the content and when do those assessments occur and so if a teacher is aware about what's going to be assessed during and what time they can go back and plan for that to make sure that their students are ready for the assessment and that the teacher has taught all the necessary content material for those assessments furthermore Teachers are ready to provide curricular scaffolds, like to provide visuals, hands-on learning activities, manipulatives and realia, also setting up um, heterogeneous language partners, um, high-low language partners. Ha teachers know where, how to identify and where to locate differentiated texts for different reading levels, um, how to incorporate graphic organizers to help students organize information and to demonstrate their thinking. 
Furthermore, students also have curricular readiness in terms of how they can modify instruction. So how can they, um, what pace they should use based on the students' listening comprehension abilities. Um, how, what parts they should repeat or emphasize or which practice needs additional practice more than others. How they should pre-teach particular vocabulary concepts um, or main concepts and then when at the end of the lesson they should what concepts they must review to make sure students understand them correctly. Finally um, we have level five and six. So level five is when the teacher is ready for programming and instructional readiness. And so they understand the program model that the school has to serve English language learners and teachers not only understand that and how to best support English language learners learning, but also they can even design their own new program models. So if the school is using um, a model where students' native language is being minimalized or removed from the classroom, the teacher can advocate to, ha to have more learning uh, opportunities in students' native language. Moreover, the teacher can ensure that the teachers, families, and students work together as a collaborative team to participate in the decision-making process. And they've done studies that show that when teachers are, and parents are in, are in regular communication, this helps facilitate students' learning. And also, when students have choice in what they're learning and in the school environment, then they're, high, they're more engaged. Finally, level six is when the teacher has readiness for application and advocacy. So in this situation, the teacher understands the theory behind language learning. So they've been reviewing what we've talked about today. They understand that there's a flexibility in instruction and that how instruction should be differentiated based on the unique needs of the student and also based on the unique needs of the school class and classroom environment. And so there's not just this rigid one-way approach, but students, but teachers find what's best for students and, and for what they have. And so they make sure they differentiate their instruction to meet the individual needs of each student. Furthermore, teachers are in a stage where they can advocate for their students. They not only are um, fluent with the curriculum. They already are well uh, versed in what students need to know and how to teach it, but furthermore they, ha they have the ability to support their students both in the school system, in the individual classroom of course, and at the local level as well in um, educational decision-making policies. So thank you very much for listening to our presentation. Stay tuned for um, future future lectures on chapter seven, excuse me, chapter six and seven in the Herrera Murray book, and also chapters eight, nine, and ten in the Herrera Murray book. Thank you.